In today's videos, we'll be talking about the problem of evil, and specifically an apologetic response to the problem of evil. Remember the word um, apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which is a rationally sound demonstration of the Christian truth. And I think it's especially important to have a rationally sound uh, response to the problem of evil. So let me set this up in this first video so you can see uh, what we're talking about and what we're not talking about. In your readings, you will uh, cover the idea, um, the argument for God based on intelligent design. And one of the arguments there is an argument from what's called irreducible complexity which is basically an argument that says that uh, if you find some kind of machine, we'll, we'll use the word machine here, that um, is designed or shows evidence of design because uh, you cannot irreduce, uh, irreduce, sorry, you cannot reduce it to uh, beyond a certain point then um, there must be a designer. I realized that wasn't uh, terribly clear, but let's use this example of a mouse trap. Mouse trap is a uh, very simple machine, if you think about it. Uh, very few parts. And it is the case that if you just remove one, one little part, it no longer functions. So uh, Michael Behe, who is one of the foremost um, apologetic scientists who uh, argues for intelligent design defines it this way a single system which is composed of several interacting parts that contribute to the basic function and where the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively stop functioning so um, when we're talking about um, a mousetrap even though it's very simple you take away one part it doesn't work and that argues for a designer it says, how much more so the human eye? And the human eye is one of the uh, places that um, apologists go to talk about the evidence of design. Take away just any of the many interactive parts and the eye doesn't work. To explain that um, development simply from an evolutionary standpoint is very difficult. There is evidence of a designer, Behe argues. Well, now, just now realize that you can't quite see all of this letter on my on the uh, screen. But um, so at the bottom, what you can't see, it says Charles Darwin, letter to Mr. Gray in 1860. So this gets us to the problem: if we argue from design for the uh, existence of God, that introduces uh, the the problem of evil. I won't read this entire letter, but I want you to see Charles Darwin, who didn't say I'm uh, I'm throwing my belief in God out the window. Um, Instead, he said, uh, I have a problem uh, understanding design and God's goodness based on what I see in nature. So just see here, he says, um, we'll start in the third sentence here. But I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do, and as I should wish, I should wish to do, evidence of design and beneficence, that means goodness, on all sides of us. In other words, we see evidence of God's design in nature and of his goodness in nature. He says this, there seems to me too much misery in the world. He specifically brings up the creature called the Ichmonidae, which is a kind of wasp that um, exists only because it feeds off the body of a caterpillar. Caterpillar. My, my um, son, when he was little, used to say caterpillar. Um, and apparently I do too. So what he what he said was this: the Ichmonidae, this kind of wasp, cannot survive without the eggs being laid in the body of a caterpillar. So this caterpillar receives these eggs, of course, unwittingly or, or um, without wanting them, and the eggs hatch and feed on the caterpillar thus killing the caterpillar so that the wasp can live. And this is the only way those eggs hatch. So um, if you're arguing from design, this wasp was designed to have to destroy another living being just to exist. You see, from, from, a, um, 
From a design standpoint, that seems cruel, he says. Or he says, just watch a cat play with a mouse. Before, before a cat um, will eat a mouse, oftentimes they will, from our viewpoint, torture it. Um, he says, so it's hard to see design and all that and goodness at the same time. So he goes on to say, certainly I agree with you that my views are not at all necessarily atheistical, that lightning kills a man, whether a good one or a bad one, owing to excessively complex action of natural laws. A child who may turn out to be an idiot is born by action of even more complex laws. And I can see no reason why a man or animal may not have been aboriginally produced by other laws. And all these laws may have been expressly designed by an omniscient creator. So he says, I can see laws at work that we can't explain, and maybe they're the result of a creator. Um, a creator who foresaw every future and event and consequence. He says, but the more I think, the more bewildered I become. So he says the problem of evil, uh, or what he would describe as unnecessary evil, um, is one reason why he isn't um, what you consider to be an orthodox Christian. So let's talk about the problem of evil. You see in the modern period, so developments um, since the Enlightenment, real concern over explaining why there is so much of what would seem to be unnecessary evil in the world. I've mentioned David Hume before. Um, Hume, of course, is the um, one of the earliest atheist intellectuals who argues against the existence of God. And he used this fourfold um, statement, which says, if God is able to prevent evil but does not, he must be malevolent. He must have bad intent. If God is willing to prevent evil but does not, um, he must be impotent. In other words, he wants to but he can't, so he lacks the power. If God is both able and willing to prevent evil, then whence cometh evil? Why is there evil here? If he can prevent it and wants to, why doesn't Why is there evil? If God is neither able nor willing to prevent evil, then why do you call him God? He must be something else. Okay, so you see the the way this argument works. One of the first times you see in Western society that people began to debate this was back in after um, All Saints Day, November 1st, 1755, when the Great Lisbon earthquake hit and created a tsunami that uh, killed perhaps as many as 100,000 people. The estimates are from um, a few tens of thousands all the way up to 100,000 people. And this was on All Saints Day. So this was um, the day after Halloween, which um, is uh, Halloween means uh, um, All Hallows Eve or All Saints Eve. And probably to most Americans doesn't have much significance. Uh, the Halloween part has been exempted from any kind of uh, religious meaning. Well, uh, especially in Catholic countries and especially um, 250 years ago, um, the big deal wasn't. All Hallows Eve, but uh, All Saints Day or All Hallows Day, which um, the dead saints of old were remembered and appreciated. And that's still done today. Well, this happened on All Saints Day in 1755. And so many innocent men, women, and children, lives were taken from them by a complete act of nature. Now, no one did anything to cause this tsunami. It was an earthquake that produced the tsunami. And so one could not look anywhere but the hand of God. And how do they explain it? And some people said, well, the reason for this was to punish us for our sin and to, to punish the sinful people. But other people said, well, why is it that the red light district where all the prostitutes were seemed to go unscathed in the city of Lisbon, where there were innocent men, women, and children on, on farms, for instance, who were, who were killed? So this created a big philosophical debate, not unlike some of the arguments you heard made after 9-11 um, here in America. Did God cause this? And uh, I would say that at that moment you heard Christians saying some very different things. So what I want to do now is just pull up a couple of videos. Uh, these are both going to be involve Pat Robertson. I'm not a huge fan of Pat Robertson. Um, not completely opposed to everything he says. Some, oftentimes I agree with it. But here, uh, I'll give you uh, a couple of examples of where he offered up his own explanations for why these awful things happen. So the first video is going to talk about 
the great earthquake in Haiti that um, killed upwards of 100,000 people just a few years ago and the reasons for it. And the second one is going to talk about um, 9-11. So he's talking with Jerry Falwell about the, the reasons for 9-11. So let me, um, I'm going to uh, move away from my PowerPoint presentation and instead I'm going to go over to YouTube. So this first video is a little over a minute. The second video I think is closer to two minutes. So we'll watch that here. And you know, Christy, something happened a long time ago in Haiti, and the people might not want to talk about it. They were under the heel of the French, uh, you know, Napoleon the Third or whatever, and they got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, "We will serve you if you'll get us free from the French." Tristan. Mm -hmm. And so the devil said, okay, it's a deal. And uh, they kicked the French out. You know, the Haitians revolted and got themselves free. But ever since, they have been cursed by, by one thing after the other, desperately poor. That island of Hispanoa is one island. Mm -hmm. It's cut down the middle. On the one side is Haiti. On the other side is the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic is, is prosperous, mm -hmm. healthy, full of resorts, etc. Haiti is in desperate poverty. Same islands. Uh, they need to have, and we need to pray for them, a great turning to God. And out of this tragedy, I'm optimistic something good may come, but right now... And now, so that's his um, explanation of the earthquakes in Haiti. Now let's go to um, his comments after 9-11-2001. This is the first time that we've been attacked on our soil. First time, and by far, the worst results. And I fear, as Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, said yesterday, that this is only the beginning, and with biological warfare available to these monsters, the Husseins, the Bin Ladens, the, uh, the, the Arafats, uh, what we saw on Tuesday, as terrible as it is, could be minuscule if in fact if in fact God continues to lift the curtain and allow the enemies of America to give us probably what we deserve. Well, Jerry, that's my feeling. I think we've just seen the, the antechamber to terror. We haven't even begun to see what they can do to the major population. I mean, the ACLU, uh, the ACLU's got to take a lot of blame for this. Oh, yeah. And I know I'll hear from them for this, but uh, throwing God off successfully with the help of the federal court system, throwing God out of the public square, out of the schools. Uh, the abortionists have got to bear some burden for this because uh, God will not be mocked. And when we destroy 40 million little innocent babies, we make God mad. I, I really believe that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who tried to secularize America, I point the thing in their face and say, you helped this happen. And now one last video. This is an interview with Stephen Fry on an Irish TV that took place last year. Uh, Stephen Fry is a famous comedian, a British comedian, and uh, we won't watch the whole thing. I just want you to get his, catch his first remarks. Suppose what Oscar believed in as he died, in spite of your protestations, suppose it's all true, mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? I will basically, what's that is the Odyssey, I think, I, I'll say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? So you see here his arguments um, for uh, against the existence of God based solely on the um, idea that there is so much unnecessary pain. He even mentioned the word that would be used here, which is theodicy. So when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about that word, the Odyssey. That'll be in the second video.